Shubhanshu Shukla becomes the first Indian aboard the ISS. It's a massive moment for him personally, but a giant leap for India's space program. The ISRO has planned a large number of activities as we go into the future. The first being, of course, the Gaganyaan crewed missions. And viewers, learnings from the ISI stint will be absolutely vital to ensure that we can develop the technical capabilities to plan crewed missions or manned missions up into space beginning next year. The Axiom 4 missions Dragon capsule carrying Indian astronaut Shubhanshu Shukla and you can see him sitting there in the ISS, huge moment and three other crewmates successfully docked at the International Space Station. Uh, moments of arrival, these uh, individuals were greeted by warm hugs by those who are already aboard and you can see them sitting around Shukla and viewers, they also got a briefing on safety measures aboard the craft. Now, Subhanshu Shukla is expected to stay aboard the ISS for about two, two weeks, during which the crew will participate in a range of scientific research, outreach initiatives and commercial projects. And with this mission, as I told you viewers, Shukla will be able to transfer lived experience to the designers, the conceivers, the engineers of the Gaganyaan mission. This serves as a crucial stepping stone for India's space program, ISRO's future projects. And viewers, the message from Subhanshu Shukla and his family has been one of absolute joy. There was a press conference also when Shubhanshu and the other three crew members were aboard the Dragon capsule and that was before the docking procedure. The docking went off smoothly. It was obviously a tense moment, but it went off smoothly and now you can see all of them there. Let's basically get an idea of what Subhanshu Shukla is likely to experience aboard the ISS and also get a sense of the learnings that he is going to take away and bring back to Earth for ISRO to build upon. We have with us Clayton Anderson, former NASA astronaut who spent a long time in space. We also have Ayam Jahangir, a space traveler, astronaut in his own right, and Sumak Ray Chaudhary, VC of the Ashoka University and astrophysicist. So let me first begin with a few questions to set the mood with uh, Clayton Anderson. I can see Clayton Anderson already there in his uh, overalls. So very much in uh, character, so to speak, we see on the right the Axiom crew in their overalls. Clayton Anderson, thank you for speaking to us. What's it like to be on the ISS? What is the experience like? Well, it's an honor and a privilege. Uh, not many people get that opportunity, so I'm very grateful for that. Uh, I think your astronaut is also very grateful, and I'm thinking that right about now he's having a great time. Uh, to be on board the International Space Station and to be serving your country uh, in that capacity is uh, a very rewarding feeling. At least it was for me. I'm sure it is for him. Uh, and his career is just starting. Um, so I'm very excited for him and the rest of his crew. Uh, I'm very jealous and envious of the opportunity that Peggy gets to keep going back into space. You know, she was my commander for a few weeks on board the International Space Station back in 2007. Uh, I would love to have the opportunity to, to opportunity to return to there and experience what they're experiencing today. Mm -hmm. um, but it's critical, I think, that having other countries involved in these efforts is important to the future of space exploration. So, so in what way is it fun? You mentioned the word fun. It's fun to be on this uh, space station. In what way is it fun? What happens? Well, I tell people that I was Superman every day. I woke up and I flew to breakfast and then I flew to work. And if I needed a break, uh, I flew into the bathroom. I flew while I was going to the bathroom. I mean, you cannot um, imagine how cool that is. And it becomes second nature. It's, it's as if someone on Earth uh, 
a little baby perhaps learns to walk for the first time, right? It's very exciting the first time, then it becomes uh, normal uh, until the next activity changes uh, your learning curve. So um, I'm sure they're struggling a little bit. They feel like they're kind of a bull in a china shop and they're kicking things off the wall um, and they're having trouble maybe operating some experiments because they haven't figured out how to do it in zero G, but that's part of the fun, right? Hmm. Part of the learning curve uh, uh, makes it enjoyable. The one question that I want to ask you, uh, do you get space, pun intended, to do your own thing up in space in the ISS? I mean, what's, what's it like personal space wise? Uh, yes, in 2007, the station was smaller than it is today, mm -hmm. uh, but I had ample space. You know, I could go into my sleep station. That was typically my go-to place. Uh, it was about the size of a telephone booth, um, and it was quiet, and I could reflect. I could cry. I could rest. I could do all the things I needed to do. Uh, today, the station's a lot bigger, so there are ample places to go and hang out. Uh, but the crew sizes are also getting bigger, which means, well, you know, sometimes you're going to be hanging out and somebody else is going to want to hang out with you, especially if you're talking about the cupola or the middle of the lab module. But uh, if you really need to get away and get into a quiet space, I think there are enough places to do that. So how has the ISS changed since you were there last? In other words, uh, what are the new additions that you've seen? Well, there are. There are multiple, most notably for me was the cupola. Um, when I flew back to the station in 2010 and the cupola was installed, it was amazing to see the earth from that venue. But unfortunately, I was like uh, your astronaut from India. He's on a two week mission, right? And the two week mission with lots of experiments means he doesn't have a lot of time to go look uh, in the cupola and out the window. Um, they also had added the European module, the Japanese module, uh, habitation module, um, uh, not to mention the, the, a couple new things on the Russian end. So uh, it's bigger, it's better. It has two bathrooms now. It has two places to prepare food. Uh, we only had one of each. Um, and so it's, it's a relatively comfortable living space uh, for four to eight people, I guess. Well, the fun has to be balanced, I suppose, with also the work that you've been assigned and tasked. And, and Professor Rachel, I have to bring you in on this. What really are the, the parameters that this mission is going to be judged by? They've set themselves a number of tasks. What do these tasks teach us? What's the end game here? The tasks, of course, uh, are scientific, some of them. And these are payloads that have been taken up. It's not the first time biological experiments are being done on the space station. But these are um, Indian experiments that are designed by Indian research groups, um, which have to be performed up there. But more importantly, it's something that you already said. It's the lived experience mm. of what it feels like to be on the rocket going there, and as, as well as um, life on the station that one has to get used to. And this will be a wealth of experience for uh, future Gaganyatris uh, that we are, as a nation, uh, are, um, are, are preparing I mean, this is also a big signal um, that India is now ready for the next phase of be having a mature uh, a space uh, um, a program in which uh, we are uh, building a lot of things. The plan is for uh, human space flights. The plan is for the next uh, going to build our own space station, as well as having um, um, a human on the moon. All of these will take um, development stage by stage and uh, it is one thing for astronauts to train in a, in a simulator, to go up there and do these tasks, live the daily experience of an astronaut, is going to educate us as to how to prepare for the others to follow uh, Shubhangshu uh, Shukla. And you know, that is the, it's a proud moment that it is a, a serious signal that uh, India as a, as a nation is ready for this big space program. And the other thing is very practical and that is, um, we learn how, how things actually work. Yeah, I, I'm going to, of course, go back to uh, Mr. Anderson in just a few moments and get a sense, really, of the time that you spend on the IS, ISS and, and how you make the best of it and what your day is going to be like. So I'm, I'm going to do that. But before that, I want to bring in Ayman Jahangir, who's been a space traveler. In other words, he's gone into space uh, 
perhaps even piloted a spacecraft. So that's, that's also challenging, isn't it, uh, Eman Jangi? That's not an easy task. Everyone just thinks that you're pointed in one direction and you're just going to flow in that direction and you're going to get to your destination. But even an inch deviation can mean a huge miss between docking with the ISS or missing the mark. So just explain the, the complex nature of that, uh, that coming together, so to speak, of the Dragon module with the ISS space station. It's not easy. Just break it down for our viewers. Yeah, so you have to remember that these, these modules, both the space station and the crew capsule, are going over 23,000 miles per hour. Wow. Quite quite fast. And it's not like trying to pull into your garage here on Earth, because here we're working, basically, it's, you know, we live in three dimensions, but when you're navigating, you're just worried about going straight and maybe to the left and right. Whereas when you are traveling in space, you have to also think about where your altitude is and, and where you are relatively compared to the Earth or wherever you're trying to get, in this, in this case, the space station. I think things in general have gotten easier because we have better computers, better autonomous vehicles, but it does require the human touch. And I think the perfect example was the last flight uh, that Butch and um, Sunita did. If you recall, mm, they yeah. had difficulty with some of their thrusters and they had to manually take control of that capsule to get it docked with the ISS. I mean, it was a very serious situation, but because of the experience that they had as pilots, the training they had had over the course of years, particularly with that uh, capsule, they were able to do it safely. So it is, it is, you know, I think when you think about spaceflight, we talk about how dangerous it is. Taking off is always very dangerous, you know, getting out of Earth's kind of orbit to where you can at least go and rotate around the Earth because you have a lot of fuel underneath you and you're sitting on top of a rocket. But then secondarily, it's trying to dock with another object and in this case the space station is also a very difficult task so yes absolutely requires a human component despite all of our automated and computerized sensors uh, because if something does go wrong you really need someone with experience to be able to do that now mr jangi the interesting thing is that shubhanshu was behind the uh, the controls here and that means that india now perhaps at least has one person who knows how to repeat that maneuver, all things being same, in the future, and, and how this sort of fits in part of the puzzle, he'll bring that back, won't he? This is a great experience. Yes. Fantastic experience, and also brings it back to the engineers at ISRO who are developing the capsule that ISRO is going to fly and the rocket that ISRO is going to fly. So this is, I think, invaluable experience for not just Captain Shukla, but for India as a whole, because... Anything that he is doing, whether it's with the Crew Dragon and the capsule that they have or on the space station, is hands-on experience that he can then bring his perspective to and help engineers and scientists back home develop their space program. How much of that goes into designing a craft, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, this uh, hands-on experience? How, much, how relevant is it? Or is it now all sort of other people have done it, so you just pick up? from the manuals, the right sort of instructions, and you put it together? I mean, definitely you're right. You know, Dr. Uh, Captain Shukla was, I think he said number 634, yeah, something that's like right. that to yeah. go to orbit. So yeah. uh, not many people have done it, but you're right. A lot of people have done it comparatively. But he might see things with a different perspective because he grew up in India and was trained in an Indian education system. And he might bring a perspective to it that, his U.S. counterparts don't have. So I think that it is valuable because he is going to see something that someone else may have never seen. And that will improve not just India's space program, mm -hmm. but space exploration for everyone. So, for so let humanity. me bring in uh, Clayton Anderson. That's an important point. Clayton Anderson, uh, just to come back to what now lies ahead for Shubhanshu Shukla, what's an average day like on the ISS, like for astronauts or for that matter, someone like Shubhanshu himself? Well, I'm... I don't know exactly what Supanchu and his crew's itinerary is, but typically uh, I would wake up around 6 a.m., 6.30 Greenwich time. So everything was based on uh, the time in London, England. Um, that gave Russia and Japan and the United States and Canada and the European Space Agency, we all kind of knew what time zone we were in. 
I would wake up about 6.30. <clears throat> I would fly down to the bathroom and do those things. Uh, and then I would have breakfast with my crewmates. And I always tried to do my exercise immediately after breakfast. I know that doesn't sound right to some people, but it worked out for me because after I did two and a half hours of exercise, I could clean up and do a towel bath. And then I put on fresh clothes or yesterday's clothes, but I was ready to go to work. And now my work day was uh, stretched ahead of me. Uh, we would have a break for coffee in the morning. We'd have lunch together. We had a break for coffee in the afternoon. We had dinner together. Um, and then your, your day is filled with uh, tasks that you have to do. And I'm imagining that the crew of Axiom 4 has the same timeline, right? That that uh, Peggy's going to work on this and the pilot's going to work on that. And, you know, so they're all marching in lockstep hmm. and doing the experiments that they have brought up uh, to complete as much science in as short a time as possible. Well, what's it like to be actually living aboard the ISS? Uh, the professor said lived experience. So, I mean, are you overwhelmed by smells? What does space smell like? What does the ISS smell like? I can see so much bonhomie on screen already, so that's beautiful. But give us the tangibles. Well, let me answer the second part first. Space smells weird. Uh, it's a unique smell. I could tell you if I smelled it right now, I could tell you that's space. But I can't really describe it. Some astronauts have said it smells like welding. It smells like uh, burnt ozone. I mean, who knows what burnt ozone smells like, right? Mm -hmm. So, it, but it's a very unique smell. And when your equipment comes back inside after a spacewalk, you can pick that equipment up and you can sniff it and you know that smell is the smell of outer space. Inside, it's kind of sterile. It's very hospital-like. Um, it's a very clean environment. The air is being pushed and exchanged constantly uh, through the systems in the space station. Um, I never really felt that there were any issues with smells, except when uh, one of my crewmates would exercise and take his sweaty clothes and wad it up into a ball, and he stuffed it behind a hatch. <laughs> and then the next day, when it was time to exercise, he just pulled those clothes back out, put them on again, and did his exercise. So that, that could be a little... Yeah. A little smelly. That's a bit off-putting. Yeah, I understand that. Of course, uh, those are general issues. But, Professor, it's important. And, and, and let's just get back to the business end of things very quickly. What are the experiments that you're most looking forward to getting information on from Shubhanshu Shukla? Well, I mean, I, there, there are certain experiments that are there uh, which are to do with future space flights. I mean, um, exploring uh, foodstuff and how one can grow... Um, various things uh, in, in, in future space flights and also on the, on the space station, etc. So there are um, Indian foods that uh, uh, Captain, uh, Group Captain Shivang Shukla has taken up. Um, these are methi sprouts and, uh, and moong sprouts and, and, and things like that. He's also taken uh, gajar ka halwa as a, as a food and stuff like that. So, but I mean, the experiments are on these uh, various food things that I, just, just finding out how um, the conditions, the weightless conditions, and also the, the conditions space station would be, uh, would affect these things. So, and then there are interesting um, organisms that have been taken up, cyanobacteria, for example, which produces oxygen and also helps in waste disposal. These things are uh, very useful to, uh, to have in a controlled manner or in, in space environments uh, and for obvious reasons, of course, and then and, and so experiments on that. Then there are various algae that both the Indian team and the European team are are experimenting on. Algae can be food stuff. Right. They can also be used in in various various things. Then there are interesting experiments on on how muscle um, behaves in yeah. uh, in weightless conditions and things like that, and how one uses electronic equipment in in space. So these are some of them are very much specific to future missions, and some are things from which you can learn a lot in general for science, not specifically for spacecraft. Well, a brilliant conversation, Professor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Eamon. Thank you very much, uh, as also Mr. Anderson. Fantastic conversation. Thank you. Very informative.